Uh, good morning and welcome to this SciDev.net Readers Conference Call. I'm Ruth Douglas, Deputy Editor for News at SciDev. So these uh, conference calls are, uh, it's a series of regular events we hold to connect our readers with experts in the field of science for development and to meet with our regional editors from around the world. Today we're focusing on COP27, which kicks off in Egypt's Sharm el-Sheikh in just five days time on November the 6th. It's my pleasure to welcome three expert guests. Yes. Let me welcome Harjit Singh, Nisha Krishnan and Maha Al-Zubi. Um, we're expecting, we hope she'll join us um, shortly. Um, many thanks to, to the three of you for uh, agreeing to join us today. I'll introduce each of them in more detail as we go along. We'll be looking at what exactly the expectations are of Global South countries for the latest climate summit and asking our guests about what developing countries want to see from COP27, what would constitute success at the summit and what's at stake for the countries most vulnerable to climate change. So first, let me welcome Harjeet Singh, Head of Global Political Strategy at Climate, Ac climate Action Network International and Global Director for Engagement and Partnerships at the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative. Great to have you here, Harjeet. While there were some big commitments at COP26 last year on things like reducing emissions, I think it's fair to say that the conference ended in disappointment from developing countries, particularly with regards to a lack of action on climate finance. So as we head into COP27, where are we at in terms of the progress made since the last conference? And are you hopeful that this one will be any more productive for those countries most vulnerable to climate change? Hi, Ruth. Uh, thank you so much for having me and a uh, pleasure to join you all. Um, well, we, we have seen the last week there were a series of reports clearly telling us that we are not on track. And um, UNEP emissions gap report echoed what uh, IPCC told us early this year, uh, that there is a closing window of opportunity and there has been inadequate progress on climate action. And, and we have to recognize that the time for incremental uh, progress is gone. Uh, and what we need is urgent uh, transformation. And, and this is where there are, you know, people do get concerned because we go to these cops and we don't get exactly uh, what we need in terms of the need on ground and the scale at which we have to reduce emissions as per the science. Um, and we have also seen backsliding uh, in the wake of uh, Russian war in Ukraine, uh, how the sh there has been a shift from uh, climate action to more energy security. Of course, with the notion of energy security, there are some more investments in renewable energy, but equally more exploration and expansion of fossil fuels, uh, which uh, particularly in Africa, which is deeply worrying. And we've also seen uh, more failing on climate finance. You know, recent numbers tell us we are again not on track to achieve the $100 billion target and majority of them still remain as loan uh, in the context where debt crisis is becoming absolutely real for majority of developing countries. So overall, it's, it's a, it's a pretty doom and gloom scenario uh, compared to you know, where, where we were just a couple of months ago because we did see some positive progress in terms of uh, climate action, but we have, we have seen backsliding happening in, in the last few months. So that's where we are. And, and of course, as we go to the COP, we would like uh, to keep the pressure on, uh, on, particularly on the rich countries to uh, up their targets on mitigation, but also provide climate finance. Uh, and of course, deliver on loss and damage finance as well, which I can talk about later. Yeah, thank you. And um, you mentioned some of the compounding global crises that we're seeing at the moment, um, that this uh, conference is taking place in the context of, and um, the war in Ukraine, the global food crisis. And in Asia this year, we've obviously seen the most devastating impacts of climate change in Pakistan. How has this affected the momentum for action or indeed the feeling around inaction? And what are, what are the priorities for the Asia Pacific region head, heading into COP27? Uh, well, Asia Pacific as a region doesn't really negotiate uh, like Africa. Uh, but in terms of priorities, it are, they're very aligned to what generally developing countries have been have been demanding. Uh, of course, the um, devastating floods in Pakistan have made all of us realize that uh, nobody is immune to climate impacts. And even big countries like Pakistan uh, are, you know, the, the, the number of people who got affected by this disaster has really shaken everybody. 
So of course, the issue of climate impacts has become a lot, lot more visible. Uh, at the same time, uh, making a point that every, every pillar of climate action is important. So we have to stay below 1.5. We have to make sure that there are sufficient resources for adaptation, but we also have to deal with losses and damages that are happening right now. So as, and from Asia region, which is not only uh, growing in terms of uh, economy, but also becoming a disaster hotspot. And, and for, for us uh, in Asia and Pacific, it's really important that we uh, move towards clean energy as, as soon as possible. And that's where the issue of climate finance is absolutely fundamental. And we also need to be ready to face climate disasters. So, so yeah, a, a lot of priorities are aligned, but uh, there's a lot more urgency that we can see now on the issues of uh, adaptation and loss and damage. Yeah, let's talk a bit more about loss and damage. Uh, last year, there was a lot of anger over the downgrading of loss and damage to a dialogue at COP26. Uh, loss and damage being the term widely used to refer to the irreversible harms caused by climate change and how to compensate for these. Uh, so instead of COP26 serving as a forum to establish a finance facility, as many people wanted to see, it simply opened a discussion around uh, the issue, as I understand it. And uh, ahead of this summit, more than 400 NGOs signed an open letter from the Climate Action Network um, calling on governments to put loss and damage finance on the agenda at COP27. Hardy, has this letter had any impact and what specifically do you want to see from developed countries with regard to loss and damage? Yeah, in fact, uh, as Climate Action Network, we have we, we made loss and damage as a litmus test for COP26, and uh, we did put a lot of pressure, and that's that's how we saw that this was prioritized at the political level. Of course, we did not get what we demanded for, that was loss and damage finance facility, but we got a dialogue, and there were many excuses made by uh, developed countries that they didn't get a mandate uh, on loss and damage finance, so they can't agree to a facility. There were not enough details. So what we did starting uh, this year, uh, January onwards, we started engaging with, uh, with the um, negotiators in the capitals. And that's where we being a network and present in almost all key countries, we made sure that there are discussions happening with the negotiators. We also came up with a paper on loss and damage finance facility uh, with our allies to, to actually outline what, what, what do we... Uh, mean by loss and damage finance facility and, and this operational modalities and functions and so on. And, and then, of course, which helped us to push even G77 in China to secure loss and damage finance on the agenda. And that pressure has been building, and that's how we work with several organizations, got support from 400 plus uh, organizations to get support uh, on putting loss and damage finance on the agenda. And as can, we were also invited by the Egyptian presidency to speak to the heads of delegations who met uh, in Cairo on 10th and 11th of September. And this is, I must tell you, this is unprecedented. Uh, we have not seen heads of delegations flying to the capital of the incoming presidency and talk only about loss and damage. That was an exclusive meeting. And then the decision came that there's a consensus, it's gonna be on the agenda. So it's for the first time, loss and damage finance is going to be on the agenda. Uh, and we have seen John Kerry actually changing uh, his, his position in the last few days, you know, from saying that it's not possible to saying, yeah, we can talk about it now saying, yes, we need to do something uh, very concrete. So we have seen that shift happening because of the civil society pressure really building up. Sorry for the long response. <laughs> no, not at all. That's, that's uh, great. And um in terms of the role of civil society, how important is that um, at these climate sum summits? Um, and uh, this week we've had a lot of criticism um, about the lack of space for civil society. Um, wh what's your take on that? So, so we totally recognize, you know, in, in, in the context in which this particular COP is, is taking place. And, and for us, there can be no climate justice without human rights because our struggles are fundamentally linked to hold those in power accountable to their citizens and to demand a safe, just, and peaceful future for all. So if we are not, if we don't have, you know, that civic space, we will not be able to demand. So for this is going to be a, a, a complex COP, there is no doubt about it. And we are working very closely with the, with the human rights groups to make sure that our, our messages are aligned and we are supporting, supporting each other. So uh, yes, so we, we do recognize the challenge. Uh, but at the same time, we also uh, know that um, how uh, we as civil society are still going to put pressure 
uh, on developed countries and i think that much space is, is going to be available to really uh, raise raise our concerns uh, so that we have some substantive outcomes at cop 27 yeah okay thanks haji i'm sure there'll be some uh, questions for you later um let me turn now to nisha nisha krishnan uh, Director of Climate Resilience for Africa at the World Resources Institute. Nisha, thank you for joining us. COP27 is being dubbed the Africa COP due to it being hosted in Egypt at a time when the impacts of climate change are being seen in really catastrophic ways in East Africa in particular. What is at stake for Africa as we approach this conference and what does the continent really need to see come out of it? Ruth, and thanks for having me here today too. Um, you know, I think some of the things that um, I would point out is, you know, you mentioned is really facing sort of the impacts at this point, whether that's floods in Nigeria or in, in Southern Africa. So I think um, as Harjeet mentioned, the continent's really rallying around COP27 as one of the ways to really uh, raise the profile of, of its of its experiences, of the stories that are on the, on the ground here. And some of the things that I think needs to come out of COP this year is one is of the progress and commitment that were made at COP26 last year, whether that's the access to finance task force, whether that is, um, you know, record breaking pledges uh, for the adaptation fund and the least de developed countries fund, which are all very important instruments under the UNFCCC that give financing for adapting, uh, adapting to um, the impacts of climate change. And then as Harjeet mentioned, loss and damage is sort of front and center, even for the continent, right? Um, you know, I think for us, there is definitely the need to address the loss and damage finance issue head on. And it's a central measure of whether there is actually space and validation for the experiences of these countries um, and the extent to which there is actually tangible process, a uh, progress, sorry. Um, and one of the things I would also um, mention is that it's not just on sort of the loss and damage finance piece, but there's also this technical assistance component to loss and damage called the Santiago Network for Loss and Damage, which is also still being held up. And so it is really this larger progress um, on the loss and damage issue that needs to be signaled uh, and seen as as sort of an understanding and the validation of the experiences of people in countries on um, all, sort of not just on the continent but really around the world and so I think there is actually one rallying cry at least coming out of coming into COP this year that hopefully will be addressed. Um, the other piece I would say is obviously on adaptation finance and adaptation in general that's um, that's one of the, you know, if we're talking about, you know, what the IPCC working group two said is that even if we were to adapt to the scale and urgency needed, we are at this point going to face irreversible losses and damages, right? So, so it, the issue and spotlight on um, loss and damage doesn't take away from the need to actually invest in adaptation and invest in adaptation at a much larger scale. You know, the most recent reports on um, adaptation finance for the continent is showing about less than $7 per capita um, that has come to the continent over the last two to three years. And that is, you know, not commensurate at all at the extent to which we actually need adaptation financing. So I think that's another big issue. Um, and the third piece related to adaptation finance in particular is actually the transparency and the space for dialogue between countries um, particularly on what resources are coming onto the, onto the continent, where is it going for what sort of sectors, because at this point countries don't necessarily have any sort of forward looking information to plan and to invest. Um, and, you know, not to just mention the energy and food security crisis, but, you know, we are also going into headwinds around economic um, debt and fiscal issues and countries on, on the continent really just don't have the space to invest in their own resilience. And so um, this conversation about adaptation finance transparency and where resources are going is also really important. Um, maybe I'll just stop there and see where Thank this you, conversation yeah. goes. Um, I mean, global climate finance is very much skewed currently towards mitigation with only about 7% going to climate adaptation. But at this year's conference, there is a big emphasis on adaptation. How, how hopeful are you that um, there will be um, significant commitments um, and action on adaptation? And also when it comes to Africa, what sort of adaptation measures can really make a difference? Thanks. Um, and I think, you know, this is... Uh, going into this, I'm not sure how optimistic I am about additional adaptation commitments at this point. Um, I think one of the things that came out of um, 
last week's release of the report on the update to the climate finance roadmap um, shows that there isn't as much progress on adaptation finance as we might need. Um, and I think um, what we really need to see, particularly on the continent and even at COP27 is this um, investment in sort of mainstreaming adaptation considerations, whether that is, you know, ministries of finance and economics actually taking on the adaptation challenge in a way that actually is informing their economic modeling, their debt structuring, their investment analysis, um, the extent to which we really focus on um, sectors like agriculture and water, which are of real importance, particularly on the continent. Um, and then actually, you know, I would see some of the challenges that we're really facing right now is not just on the lack of financing and the quality of financing so not just to have more loans um, but actually access to concessional or to grant financing that will is actually invest in adaptation but it's also having actually more um, coherent policy structures and then i think one of the most important things that's still lacking is whether resources actually reach community levels, right? So oftentimes it can get stuck in within intermediaries and national governments and not actually reach local governments and vulnerable communities communities on the front lines. Um, so how do we actually structure either our governments and or our climate funds such that money does reach the ground? So I think that's another big um, area where there's a challenge, but also the opportunity to invest in adaptation on the continent. And uh, Nisha, last year's COP26 climate talks in Glasgow yielded a pledge to double the financing available for adaptation. What has come of those pledges? As we know, unfortunately, not too much. I think um, I just mentioned the up the climate finance roadmap um, last week on Friday. Mm -hmm. And I think we've seen some progress in terms of more countries making pledges for actual adaptation finance targets so that we're getting closer. Um, to the 40 billion um, sort of number by 2025. Um, I think there are 12 countries who've made that uh, an actual year mark on, on their climate finance. But um, I don't, so at the end of the day, $40 billion a year is, is not necessarily enough. It's not actually an ambitious target if you think about how much, what the scale of adaptation needs are. Um, the sort of the number that I've seen quoted, for example, by the African Development Bank for the continent alone is $124 billion per year. And so $40 billion per year globally is a less than what a third of what is actually needed um, just for the continent alone. And as we um, potentially don't mitigate as fa fast as we need or you know, we generally will probably see rising adaptation costs, right? Um, so I think um, there isn't really enough progress, um, regardless of whether that's the MDBs, the multilateral development banks, or bilateral finance on adaptation. And so the question is, how can countries, mm -hmm. even who are already paying for adaptation, step up even more, right? And that's unfortunately the conversation we just, we need to have. Um, and I would just say that particularly for the continent, but also globally, private sector mobilization for adaptation is minimal. And so what can we do if we are actually going to talk about um, investing in resilience of our own economies and our own communities? How do we actually get them to move on adaptation, not just on mitigation and low carbon emissions? Thanks, Nisha, that's great. Um, I'm just noting a comment from one of our readers saying, we'd love to move away from the use of term the term developing countries, who defines development, a little bit of a hangover from colonialism now. And um, my apologies, I think that's um, something that we're a little bit guilty of in me the media world. Um, perhaps uh, and many NGOs have moved away from that, that terminology and the um, media, media have been slow to do so, um, but thanks for that. And yes, as Ben says, we usually use the term low and middle income countries in our articles, though developing countries can be often um, is an easier way for, for headline writing purposes. Um, hence why it uh, still does get get used to some extent. Um, OK, fine. Thank you. And um, let me welcome Maha Al Zubi, um, who has um, I think joined us from Cairo. Maha is a researcher on agriculture water solutions at the International Water Management Institute, and she co-leads an initiative for the Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research to build climate resilience in the Central and West Asia and North Africa region. 
Welcome, Maha. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Ross. Uh, um, my apologies for, for being a uh, few minutes uh, uh, late. That's and, absolutely uh, fine. I'm joining you from Amman. Oh, from Amman. Time. Yes, I'm, I'm now in Amman. Uh, so uh, thanks. Great to uh, have you. Thank you. So the arid MENA region, which has always had uh, challenges around water scarcity, is one of the regions likely to be hardest hit by climate change. What impacts are already being felt there and how do you see these worsening if we continue in the current trajectory? Uh, thanks. Um, actually, um, uh, just uh, always good just to uh, to see uh, if there is evidence. So the uh, the latest uh, IPCC report actually provides a clear uh, scientific evidence that MENA uh, region is um, a hotspot uh, when it comes to climate. So uh, with increased the drying and um, uh, warming uh, over the uh, the last few decades. Um, and uh, the prediction, like uh, if this trend will um, uh, continue, so uh, that's going to be an increase in frequency in the next uh, year. So uh, uh, climate effects so far um, is bringing um, a current um, um, uh, pressure on the rain-fed agricultural systems uh, with less precipitation, um, leading to a reduction in the um, uh, profitability of, of uh, uh, farms. Uh, and that hit uh, uh, mostly uh, small farmers. So an increase in, in uh, water scarcity as well, depletion of uh, uh, biodiversity uh, in the region and accelerated the, uh, the land degradation. So it's, it's um, a very complicated uh, situation when we are talking here in, in uh, MENA. We already have a scarce uh, uh, resources uh, when it comes to land and, and water. Uh, we have the issue of energy now. Uh, some countries are rich in energy, others are, uh, are poor. So, uh, and as you know, like, um, uh, agriculture, food security without uh, water and energy can't be uh, uh, achieved. So, um, um, there, therefore, like um, the issue of the climate um, adaptation and mitigation is uh, becoming more and more on the uh, policy table. Uh, however, not as uh, uh, we want and uh, and aim. But uh, lately, we've been seeing more, uh, let's say, um, uh, 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 commitment to, through the countries um, uh, through their uh, 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 latest developed um, uh, NDC reports, where many countries uh, updated their uh, target. But this is subject to uh, climate uh, uh, finance, as um, my um, uh, uh, the previous. Uh, contributor colleague mentioned that um, uh, as uh, developing uh, countries, um, uh, the countries or public uh, uh, finance is really limited. So uh, this is uh, this is in in all is is leading to uh, more unemployment um, uh, as well um, um, uh, having uh, more poor people um, uh, the gap between rich and poor is, is becoming more and more so um, and that increases the vulnerability and uh, the issue of fragility uh, at all. Yeah, and the. Um... The UN said last week that there was currently no credible pathway to a 1.5 degree rise in global temperatures as targeted by the Paris Agreement. Last year at COP26, we saw countries pledge to keep this goal alive. What can you tell us about efforts um, made in the Middle East to do that? And what commitments can we expect from MENA countries at, at COP27, do you think? So uh, to be honest, like this year and next year, uh, all world is looking to the Middle East, where like this year, COP27 in, in Sharm el-Sheikh and next year in in, uh, in UAE. So uh, that's, a, that's a good sign that uh, these countries uh, are committed um, in a longer term. But uh, lately, actually, since uh, last year, since COP26, um, we have seen really uh, a good progress in, in the region, like um, on two levels. Uh, updating the, uh, uh, let's say, climate change targets um, and uh, through the climate-related uh, investment. So when it comes to targets, for example, uh, like um, according to uh, a just um, um, uh, published uh, UN climate um, uh, 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 change, uh, let's say, report this week, like Egypt and uh, uh, United Arab Emirates are among the 26 um, countries that have updated their um, climate targets in line with promises made uh, last year at COVID-26. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, for example, Egypt is a 
promising uh, uh, to further cut greenhouses uh, emissions uh, from electricity, transport, uh, oil and gas. Uh, UAE is uh, pledging to cut greenhouse uh, gas emissions uh, by 31st percent uh, by 2030. So uh, this commitment is really promising. Uh, from investment side, actually, for example, Saudi Arabia is um, uh, or invested already around uh, 1.5 billion uh, in uh, solar energy alone last year, um, and uh, UAE has bought uh, uh, almost 9 billion uh, into technology since 2017. So this kind of, of uh, um, however, it's um, uh, two or three countries in the region, but this is really promising uh, as other countries are limited when, with financial uh, resources. But in all, if I'm talking about uh, MENA actually, in short term, uh, most countries now investing in renewable energy and uh, wind and hydropower uh, to meet the climate targets. Uh, in the long run or term, uh, in the Middle East, um, we could say like um, 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 nations are um, ironing uh, ways to capture uh, carbon, uh, whether directly from uh, hydrocarbon plants or from uh, atmosphere uh, uh, by boosting like size of, of um, ecosystem, for example, the latest um, uh, uh, a great uh, uh, green initiative by Saudi Arabia, like a plantation uh, um, or a planting 50 uh, billion trees. This is a huge investment in the coming in the coming years. I will stop here uh, to give room for others as well. Thank you. And so, what does the MENA region really need to see from COP27 in terms of the transition to clean energy, or indeed any of the other issues that we've discussed this morning? Um, more finance, because not all uh, Middle Eastern countries are rich uh, uh, or uh, oil uh, producers. Uh, so uh, more finance, um, uh, more focus on adaptation, particularly when we are talking about uh, water and agriculture. This is a uh, hugely needed, uh, as most of the Arab countries, even rich countries, they are uh, uh, desalinating um, and uh, uh, water. So uh, water, agriculture, uh, food security in the region is, is is very much needed. Uh, plus, uh, uh, in addition to the finance, like mechanism and accessibility to finance, it's not like but uh, uh, committed or pledging money. It's how this country can uh, easily uh, access to this uh, to this finance. Uh, plus, when we are talking about uh, uh, linking as well, um, uh, some countries in the region are post-conflict countries. They require more attention and um, uh, support. Uh, like, for example, Sudan, when we are talking about like Yemen, when we are talking about Iraq, when we are talking about Syria. So these countries require attention because they lack uh, capacity, they lack infrastructure, uh, a climate change, um, uh, impact is worsening their um, human uh, conditions. Uh, so hopefully that uh, would give some attention to post-conflict countries and the issue of immigration because of the climate change. So this, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, we are uh, at a personal level, expert level aiming to. Uh, so hopefully this would be uh, as well uh, equal important for, for policymakers and uh, delegate in, in Sharm el-Sheikh. Thank you. We've, let me um, take some questions from, from our readers. Uh, we've got one from Dr. Jayaraman. Um, my apologies if I've mispronounced that. Uh, he's, he or she says, have we tried or placed importance in quantitative, oh dear, I've lost it, sorry. Um, in quantitative and scientific water management, before getting panicky on monsoon variation, do we take infinite quantity of water as resource? Desalination technologists are speaking of agro-industrial complexes. Um, um, does anyone want to have a go at this question? <laughs> I'm not quite sure. Um, perhaps. Dr. Dr. Jaraman, would you like to um, would you like to speak and and just uh, expand a bit more on what what your question is? No, I want to condense my oh, question in shorter uh, words. Hello, uh, thank you. Is there been quantitative assessment of water management when we are getting panicky on monsoon drift too? Desalination technology in various forms have thought about agro-industrial complexes for water management. What is our response to these two situations? 
Okay, who feels uh, in a position to answer that one? How about the desalination issue? Could anybody answer on that? Because I think that's quite an important one, isn't it? Perhaps, Maha, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, so, um, when it comes to desalination, actually, um, uh, for example, um, Jordan now, uh, due to the water scarcity, and um, uh, is moving toward a big uh, uh, desalination plant, bringing water from Red Sea to Dead Sea. Uh, for different purposes. First, to restore the uh, um, gradual uh, decrease in water level in the Dead Sea, plus uh, securing water uh, for uh, drinking purposes. That will substitute other um, uh, water for other purposes like agriculture and, and industry, uh, giving the um, population growth, the uh, development, um, uh, social economic needs in Jordan. So, uh, Desalination is is um, is now becoming um, a technology where uh, it became more innovative, introducing the renewable energy as well. It's not just like um, depending on oil and uh, uh, like the traditional resources. So uh, this technology um, uh, having a renewable energy to it that would offset some uh, 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 GHG uh, gases, uh, plus uh, that would secure really like a, a water for for people so uh, uh, like gulf states um, it's been um, they have a long history in desalination uh, as they have um, a water scarcity they have a limited the groundwater uh, resources they are scarce in terms of precipitation so uh, these countries like uh, kuwait uh, uae uh, saudi arabia uh, oman uh, qatar all depending on uh, desalination. Now technology advanced, um, uh, less dependent on, on uh, even the technology like using RO or other technology, it become more advanced. Uh, the cube water, uh, let's say price is become uh, less that can be affordable. However, it's still subsidized for, for, uh, for um, uh, consumers. Uh, but uh, yeah, desalination is, is, uh, is, uh, is very important in terms of technology in, in the Middle East. If we are uh, either uh, desalinating the uh, uh, sea water or uh, some uh, uh, groundwater is already brackish and it's already saline. So uh, these two options, either uh, uh, sea water or groundwater, it's uh, still expensive maybe in Jordan, uh, uh, but in other countries it's been advanced and the country's been demanding on it um, uh, for long. So hopefully that uh, that would help um, in, in, in at least maybe partially in answering this question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let me take another question about, this one's about loss and damage and adaptation finance. Um, the reader says, we're seeing the justice with a bipolar lens of North versus South when it comes to loss and damage and adaptation finance. How about long prevailing internal disparities in many so-called climate vulnerable countries where marginal groups are socially, economically, politically, and environmentally marginalized beyond their capacity of their survival? Again, given loss and damage finance is agreed, would that guarantee that the finance would reach the poor? Uh, I think this is an epistemic hypocrisy of the knowledge elites of the global south. What, um, who, who would like to, Haji, perhaps uh, you'd like to take this one. I can, I can uh, start. So um, yes, absolutely. All these issues are, are real and do exist in developing countries. Uh, but we need to understand when we go to COP, uh, we talk about issues between countries. And that's, that's why we are going to the UN. This is a fight at the national level, which we must continue to fight and we do that. So in, the, in climate negotiations, when we take sides of developing, it seems we take sides of developing countries. Uh, we, don't, we don't side with governments, we side with people from developing countries. And, but back home, look at some of us, the role that we play, we fight with our own governments to exactly address what you are saying. So it's not either or, but we need to understand which forum we take what kind of fights. So at COP, it's important to talk about inter-country inequality, who has caused the problem, who must pay for loss and damage. And when we go to the national level, we talk about whether that money is reaching the person who it is intended for and whether they are able to hold their own governments to account from local to national level. Absolutely. So it's not either or. We need to fight all these fights in different forums. 
I can just add to that. I think, you know, to your question as well, I think you're also seeing this come up in the in the international conversation, right? So for example, um, for adaptation in particular, there was um, sort of an elaboration of these eight locally led adaptation principles that talk about um, that basically talk not just about the uh, need for devolution of finance, but also the decision making around finance, right? Such that communities actually get to decide what their adaptation priorities are. It's not just about here's money to, for you to do whatever we tell you to do. Um, so I think there is also this acknowledgement that it is not just national governments that need to be understanding of these principles, but also international organizations. And so I think there is this push to have more accountability. And so even the, the point that I made earlier about the transparency of finance, it's not just the transparency of finance to national governments, but also, you know, a lot of the times there are investments made in countries that national governments have no idea about because of that's how the development sort of finance institutions operate, right? So I think there's also a push for this. And then your point about loss and damage finance is absolutely right. Like we need to be set, we need to learn from the lessons of the last you know, 20 years about talking about climate finance and adaptation finance in some form or the other, and have those accountability and transparency structures also for loss and damage finance, such that if we are talking about how finance reaches the ground, we are ready for that conversation. We also see quite a lot of finance accountability initiatives happening within countries, as Harjit was saying, that includes like budget analysis and looking at where countries themselves are investing, but also where these international organizations are investing adaptation, you know, are there decision making processes that actually support the better decision making around adaptation priorities. Can we get climate impact knowledge in the hands of communities so that they can design their own initiatives? So I think there is definitely an understanding and acknowledgement that this needs to happen and not just in sort of vulnerable countries, but also in your countries like the US and others where you do need to push your governments, right? So it's not an issue just for the South. It is an issue that is, uh, you know, actually apparent in all countries who are dealing with these impacts. Thanks, Nisha. Just a reminder that our regional sidedev.net regional editors are also with us. Um, so please feel free to put any questions to those um, regarding uh, various um, different regions. Uh, we have a Sub-Saharan Africa English edition, Sub-Saharan Africa French edition, um, Middle East and North Africa edition, and Latin America, Latin America and Caribbean edition. So, um, Ruth, may I uh, just share um, some concern, actually, since we are like just now. Um, um, uh, the only concern that I'm, I'm recently having after what happened in Ukraine and like still going, actually, and we are heading to winter. So um, my concern is like, um, hopefully, like this situation will not change some of the um, the game dynamics when it comes to uh, the energy now energy on top of priority for for most of the north part of the world and still like uh, important for the southern part but now when it comes to um like what uh, harji just mentioned that inter-country um uh, dynamics and relations this is very important like now uh, like every day we hear like some new news about like um uh, europe uh, countries in terms of like uh, oil and gas and uh, uh, who is depending on uh, who and um, uh, that ukraine situation as well like uh, taught the world uh, a lesson like to be um, uh, self-sufficient like uh, food security it uh, like uh, uh, the second day of the war, like uh, prices in in the Middle East, like just goes up, like without even uh, uh, touching the new uh, commodities coming, like just like the stock, everything get get uh, up. Uh, so this um, hopefully that will will not um, impact the, the what the countries committed uh, uh, because now uh, like it's more become more human needs like we need energy we need to to get warm we need to uh, to sustain in, in other uh, related um, uh, uh, activities depending on energy so um, it's just like a concern uh, that I'm, I'm sharing and um, I would love to hear other uh, thoughts about from um, uh, uh, like uh, Nisha from um, uh, uh, Harjit as well, you yourself and others, if if, uh, if they share the same concern or it, it's only mine, uh, my concerns. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Nisha or Harjit, do you have anything um, on, on that point? I know there are lots of uh, concerns that COP27, you know, has been 
clouded by the war in Ukraine and um, that climate has gone off the radar for many countries because of that. Um, and yet, as, as Maha says, these, these issues are obviously interconnected and, and should really shine a spotlight on, on the need for, um, for climate um, action. Nisha is going yeah. fast. Go yes, I'm going to her. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Archie. No, I was just going to say, no, I think I share those concerns. And I it's coming up, if, for example, in how the Democratic Republic of Congo has, uh, you know, at least auctioned off or is trying to auction off oil and gas leases within the within the Congo Peace and Forest as well. And I think it is also just emblematic of the fact that there are development pressures, right? They're not just sort of the impacts of of the war in Ukraine, but there are also very real development pressures on how do you actually address these very um, pressing needs for investment and revenue for education, for health systems, for actually investing in your own communities. And so where is that sort of um, alternative source of finance? And if that's not climate finance, which is where the promises have been, um, then what do countries have to do? And it's honestly a question of how do you ensure food security? How do you ensure even um, political stability potentially within countries, right? So I think these are all intertwined. And, the, and I think COPs are no longer just a climate talks. They are very real talks about climate and economics and development, and we need to frame them as such. It is not just for the climate people to be there. Um, but at this point, if you're having heads of state attend these talks, it is in this view of this means different things for us. Um, so yes, share your concern on, on the fact that we're going into winter and that we'll be seeing some of the impacts on energy prices. But I also think it's actually a concern that I'm starting to have about COP28 and the fact that we in the Middle East and where oil and gas is one of the biggest sources of revenue. So, you know, what does that mean going into 2023 as well? So, and that's, I don't have any answers. I just added more, I think, fuel to the fire, but uh, hopefully someone else does. So, yeah, just to build on, uh, so I think what, one, we are extremely late in talking about these issues. We knew the interconnections. We knew that we need to have a plan. We just uh, engaged ourselves in blaming each other. You do first, and, and then, then I will act. And, and so, and I'll not provide money. Look at how rich countries have failed in meeting their fair shares, both, both on mitigation as well as finance. And that's why we, have, we are where we are, where countries like DRC have no option left. Africa, many African countries are seeing the investments uh, on fossil fuels uh, as uh, you know as an opportunity because the what, what else they have been offered in the last few years when we knew about the potential of africa on renewable energy for a very long time uh, so we have really failed and we have just talked a lot more at a top level without getting into details you know for example if we talk about continues you know countries being dependent on on oil revenues you know we look at Congo, that's 60% of their government revenues come from oil. And, you know, uh, same is the case for uh, Angola, around 50%. But if you look at US, Canada, UK, heavily invested in fossil fuels, but yet a tiny proportion of their economy, uh, whereas extremely high per uh, GDP per capita, they, they could do it much, much easily. And then there are other countries who need to be supported. So where is the plan for just transition? And, and this is exactly the reason, you know, you know, I'm also engaged with the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty initiative. You're saying Paris Agreement, we are talking about the demand side of the problem. Let's also talk about the supply side of the problem. You know, how we can tackle the fossil fuel industry, how we can support countries who need that just transition. Uh, and we need a plan for that. So we have failed in developing a plan. And that's why, you know, all this confusion, you know, whether the DRC is going in the right direction or not. And then the, you know, development versus, uh, you know, environment and, and all these debates. So we, we could have sorted a lot of things uh, but uh, nevertheless, we, we need to now talk about just transition and international cooperation and support. Thank you. Uh, I think um, Dr. Jayaraman, uh, who we heard from later, would also make a, like to uh, respond to that question. Please, please go ahead. Yes, uh, we have been told that uh, no power is costlier than no power in the sense that there is an irreducible minimum of power for human development index to be achieved. Right now, because of the greenhouse gas emission, we are going to have a cap on energy production from the fossil fuel. And there is a shift, a paradigm shift as far as nuclear power SMRs are concerned. Right now at Ukraine, we have a nuclear reactor designed by the Russians, operated by the Ukrainians. That is the real testing problem for our future 
energy scenario. Thank you for that. Okay, so we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, are there any more questions? I have a question, Ruth, if that's hmm. okay. Um, it's really just, you know, we, we, we talk, we're hearing from people, you guys who are close to the these discussions, we're hearing about what seem to be quite obvious things that we need more money for adaptation, that, you know, rich countries need to pay what they owe for loss and damage. And it seems from the outside inexplicable that such little progress is being made. What are you hearing from those negotiations? Why are countries so resistant? And what can be done to, to change that and to challenge that? I'll go first and Harjit Maha, please do come in. Um, so I think at this point, uh, maybe going into this year in particular, I think countries are resistant, particularly because of, well, their own financial and fiscal situation. It's not like anyone really has much to spare, especially uh, post-COVID recovery. And I think one of the things that definitely came out last year was potentially the hypocrisy of how much developed countries invested in, uh, in sort of bringing out their own economies from pandemic, but didn't necessarily have that political will to show for climate right, um, finance. And I think, uh, I'm not sure any of us have mentioned this, but I don't think that the um, status of trust between countries that is at an all-time high. In fact, we're trying to recover from an all-time low potentially in this in this space. Um, so I think you're asking the right questions and you know what are the levers to um, to really influence countries to step up and to fulfill their commitments. I think the thing is that we're really good at making commitments. We're not so great at actually following through with them. So I think the transparency and accountability aspects, not just at COPs, but throughout the year, whether that is at the World Bank IMF meetings, whether that is at bilateral uh, conversations, whether that's at UNGA, it needs to be sort of all throughout the year. Um, and it needs to come not just from civil society, but from governments themselves asking their government counterparts for where these resources are. Um, I think the other piece that is already coming to the front is the fact that countries um, on the continent, countries across the globe are already investing in their own resilience and in, in trying to transition, right? Um, and I think making sure that that is actually um, observed that is actually reported out that's uh, that's brought up in every single form possible is is one of the ways to go forward um, and the extent to which obviously countries ourselves can integrate these demands to any other demand that's made and in fact you know there's quite a lot of investment in security there's a lot of investment in other aspects of of sort of um, the global diplomacy um, and I think that just climate just needs to be up and top and that it's no longer again a climate issue that's an economic issue and I think that's the that's the way to go about it let me pick up exactly where Nisha left these are not climate talks had they had they been only climate talks we would have solved the problem 30 years ago you know this is all about economy and trade and and rich countries wanting to maintain uh, their their uh, you know uh, control over um, finance and that's why we have less money uh, for green climate fund and still more flowing outside the system uh, still uh, although inadequate and i think we, we we do understand who who's making money or who has made money in the last two years is fossil fuel industry obscene amount of money windfall profits we know that money is there uh, and then here, ordinary people, not just now in the in, in developing countries or low and middle income countries, also in rich economy, rich countries, they are suffering. So money is being, you know, uh, so fossil fuel industry is now um, has made windfall profits, but we are not taxing the, them enough to deal with the cost of living crisis, uh, also in the rich countries, but also use that money to address loss and damage. So I think again, it goes back to the lack of political will we know the problem we know the solution but we are not really doing that enough and uh, all the problems that we are facing and again we discussed that uh, just a while ago the the issues are uh, or the um, uh, causes are are common and that's where the uh, private sector uh, is only looking at profits in fact there was a i was watching a congressional briefing where they showed how private companies in general have made so much of money in the last three years when you know, majority of people in, in the world actually suffered from COVID crisis to now cost of living crisis and climate crisis. And, and this is where we need to have, a, you know, a united civil society, united developing countries, and really challenge the whole model of development itself, which has not happened. We have been only talking about incremental change, as I mentioned in the beginning, the kind of transformation that is needed, 
it's still not being talked about. And I think that's where we need to talk about common causes and then what kind of solutions we need, which are which need to be transformative. Great, thank you. I'll take one last question. Oh, sorry, Baha, did you have- No, no, I, I want just like to to uh, to support what uh, been been said by Nisha and uh, Harjit. I have uh, no more to add. It is like, it's just like uh, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one last quick question from Julien, who is our, our regional coordinator for Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, our French edition. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Julien Chongwang. Uh, I'm the regional coordinator for the French edition of uh, Saide. So my question is that um, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the average citizen wonders about the usefulness of the COP because people know that every year uh, we, organize, we organize the COP but since to, uh, COP21 in Paris, the local populations have not registered any real changes in terms of solutions to deal with, with climate change. So my question is, uh, can COP27 this year be different from the others and lead to concrete changes, for example, in terms of providing uh, finance or other things for Africa uh, against adaptation, for adaptation? Thanks, Julian. So it's a good question to to end on. What would what uh, concrete actions um, could be delivered, and um, yeah, what would make this um, summit a, a game changing summit in the way that others perhaps have not been? So I, Nisha, no, go ahead. So I I would just start like a. a um, just hopefully we can still keep uh, the country's commitment in, in terms of uh, the GHE uh, targets. So this is like a starting point. Like uh, every year we, we as experts, researchers, scientists, we dream of really uh, high high targets. But this year with, with the, what's going on the world, hopefully at least we like these countries keep their commitments. Uh, if more, that would be great. But hopefully if they can keep these commitment, definitely more funding um, uh, that we've been dreaming uh, of um, that was not um, um, uh, delivered since the last COP. But um, yeah, more um, uh, thinking of adaptation, uh, that would be great. But uh, these actually the, the things that we are aiming to. Um, um, I'm I'm sure that uh, everyone sometimes is is uh, up and down in in like um the way that we we look to cope, but it's having such a great event is always important just to highlight the 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 issue of of the climate change because like if we go back ten years ago like so many deniers to climate change now at least we have uh, policymakers decision makers uh, states coming to talk about it so uh, I know it's like not the progress we aim to but at least we have seen people coming and talking people at a higher level uh, uh, that by its own is, is an achievement thank you Nisha or Hajit okay I uh, Nisha do you want to go first okay uh, yeah just just to build on uh, we know it's it's highly frustrating when you look at every year and I keep going back to the world, little incremental progress uh, and a lot of frustration. You know, you can actually see the press releases coming from us uh, look quite similar, you know, uh, for the last several years, So, which is a reality. Uh, but at the same time, I would say there's no other place to go. Should we depend on G7s and G20s? Have G7s delivered? Have our regional blocks delivered as much? No. And when we talk about global justice, we have to go to the UN. You know, even if not practically, theoretically speaking, all countries are equal, right? And it's one country, one vote. So this is the only place that we have where we can demand global justice, however slow or frustrating it has been. So coming to this COP, uh, we have to focus on implementation and Egyptian delegation, um, uh, uh, Egyptian presidency is rightly doing so. They're putting a lot of spotlight on lack of finance in general and loss and damage finance in particular. And another issue that's also coming up, which also helps us connect the issues of human rights and climate justice much more, much more strongly this time. So, so for us, as Maha said very rightly, these COPs, you know, there are places, these are, this is the place to achieve justice, but also to raise our voice and raise awareness and put pressure on, on uh, governments to act. Thanks, Hajit. And finally, Nisha, would you like to, to finish off? Julian, thanks for coming with the hardest question of the last. <laughs> um, but I think Mahan and um, Harjeev have really covered this well. I mean, I think um, there is really no other venue. Um, and there is, and I'm actually really glad for the level of attention that COPs even get these days. 
So I think that that in itself is progress, right? That is the fact that you're covering this, uh, the fact that there are other lots of other media organizations actually covering COP discussions, even if they're not the most tantalizing events um, at the, on the calendar. I think the attention is helpful and the fact that there are communities asking about what is happening on the ground and what is adaptation in the first place, I think is progress as well. It might not, it's not, I think, a bomb to any of us that there isn't more um, action happening on the ground, but um, the incrementalism right now is unfortunately the only way that we have forward. So um, hopefully that changes, but for now, this is what we have. And for African Nisha, what in a nutshell would constitute success at COP27? I think when, as we started at the top of the hour, I think one is obviously the, the addressing of heads at loss and damage head on and the fact that there is actually a political space to discuss this on the agenda and what that comes out of it. I think the second piece is this attention and adaptation um, and whether or not they're new financial commitments, I think the lack of financial commitments is news in and of itself. And I think even the Africa Adaptation Summit that happened earlier this year in September was indicative of that, right? The fact that donors didn't necessarily show up to that event. So I think that's the other piece that needs to happen. And third is this point that Harjeet made, which is implementation and accountability for implementation over the last year from COP26 into COP27. And whatever else the Egyptian presidency decides to announce this year as initiatives and what is that progress going to look like going forward. So I think those are the three big things I would say. Thanks, Nisha. And thanks all three of you. That's been a really interesting um, discussion. Uh, it's been great to have you. Thank you everyone for joining as well. We've come to the end of um, today's session. Um, so thank you once again. Uh, we, as I say, these are regular events um, and you um, that we hold on different themes. So we hope to see you again.